Hi and welcome to our Compositional Algebra. Today we'll be discussing Chapter 13 on triangles and shading. So if we think about triangles, uh, we've already talked briefly before about a triangle is mapped by its vertices P1, P2, and P3. And those are points. Vertices can live in 2D or 3D or actually in 50D. It doesn't matter how many dimensions they are. A triangle is the plane connecting those points. Um, the three points define a plane and they're the smallest number of things that define a complete plane. So our conventions, we're going to label the PIs counterclockwise so that when you're looking down at the triangle as though it was on the face of a clock, the orientation of the, the, the connections go counterclockwise. The edge opposite the point PI is labeled SI, so if this is point P1, this is side one, it goes from two to three, so the point opposite PI doesn't include PI, so it has the other two points in it. So those are some just naming conventions and structural conventions, but some of these will be important because we want to talk about what's inside and outside the triangle and that'll matter. So barycentric coordinates, which we've also briefly talked about before, were invented by Mobius in 1827, and they define a local coordinate system. Given any three uh, points, they define a coordinate system that I can use by taking some coefficient u times the first point plus v times the second point plus w times the third point. And as we're also going to add the constraint that the coefficients have to sum up to equal 1. In this case, <laughs> it's a convex combination that has to live inside the triangle or on the edges. Okay? Um, and we can represent that then as a linear system where we have p1, p2, p3 times u1, u, u, v, and w gives us p1, p2, and 1. So that gives us a set of constraints. Um, if we solve for that and look at it, it turns out that we can solve that 3x3 three three linear system using Kramer's rule, and we get a geometric interpretation of this that u is the area of the point p plus p2, p3, divided by the area of p1, p2, p3. So going back to the drawing, we take p, p1, p2, so the ratio of this triangle over the total triangle gives us the coordinate for u. Similarly, for V and W, we get the area of the point we're trying to describe and the two corresponding other points divided by the overall area. Um, and this is called barycentric coordinates. Some nice properties. Well, these are ratios of area, so what happens under a fine transformation? Um, they'll be preserved. Um, they sum to 1. They're not independent. Clearly, given U and V, I can define W. It's 1 minus U minus V. If I let p equal some of the ver some vertex, for example p two, then u one is equal to one, and the other two points will be equal to zero. Okay, and if you're on a side, then the opposite, uh, then one of the three coefficients is, is zero. So, by looking at the coefficients, we can tell if we're completely inside because all of u, v, and w will be not equal to zero. If we're on an edge, u is equal to zero, or if we're at a vertex, one of them is zero and the other two are zero. And of course, with floating point numbers, we have to be a little bit careful; they're not going to be equal, but as long as they're really close to zero, we can say we're almost on the edge. So to show that they're in fine and varying, the property of ratios is, is useful. Um, let's say we're given a triangle P1, 0, 0, P2, 1, 0, and P3, 0, 1, and 2D. If we apply a 90 degree rotation to that shape, um, we're going to get three new, uh, what we'll call P hats, which are the rotated versions of P. And now let's just take the, ce the center, the barycentric coordinates of 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. That gives us the point one-third and one-third in this case. Um, but if I take the, that shape and I apply the rotation matrix to it, that's our rotation matrix, I'm going to get minus one-third and one-third. Now if I go back and I apply the rotation matrix to each of P0, P1, and P2 to give me P1 hat, P2, P hat, P3 hat, and then I sum them all up by taking one-third, that is the barycentric representation, it also gives us the same point. So barycentric in the original coordinate system and barycentric in the in coordinate system give us the same points, which is one of their nice properties. Makes it easier for us to do certain calculations, not worrying about what happened to them during the affine transformation. So a useful thing we have to deal with in triangles is, is actually not just one triangle, but a bunch of triangles, what we call a triangulation or a tessellation. Um, and they can be both in 2D, 3D, as many dimensions as you need to. Uh, and for these, we want to use them, we can use them for surveying, for dealing with land, for rectifying images, for graphics, for finite element analysis. They have lots of uses. So in this example, we're going to do them in 2D, but you can really do the same. We'll, we'll generalize the 3D in a bit. So the set of triangles that are formed by a set of 2D points, 
such that we're going to give them the properties. The vertices of the triangles consist of the points PI. Okay? Interiors of any two triangles do not intersect. So no, these, none of these triangles actually overlap each other. If two triangles are, uh, are not disjoint, then they share a vertex or an edge. So if I have two triangles and they're not disjoint, disjoint means they have nothing in common. If they have anything in common, then they're going to share an edge. Triangles don't meet at just a point. Um, the union of all the triangles equal the convex hull of all the points. Convex hull is the shape from all of those. Um, so we, again, we can have edges in common, points in common, but we can't overlap. So we can have lots of other things going on. So the following are then illegal triangulation. So here I have triangles, but here there's no vertex in the, the middle. It's okay if they, over if they join at a corner, but if they do so at a corner, that corner has to be part of all triangles. So down here, this set of triangles occurs, but this triangle doesn't have this as a, as a vertex. So this is also illegal. And then um, there's no triangle connecting here. In fact, it would take two triangles to connect it. So the convex hull has got a gap in it, which is not included. So all of these are illegal triangulations. So we can talk about the valence, the number of triangles that surround a vertex, and a star triangles around a vertex. Those are some terminology pieces we'll use a little bit, but I'll, I'll use valence much more often. Um, so it's important to recognize that triangulations are not unique. Um, given a set of points, I can move uh, this tri set of triangles and triangulate it this way instead. Um, and among the many possible triangulations, we have a special one called the Delaunay triangulation, which is commonly agreed to be sort of the best triangulation in terms of the si size and shape, and they have lots of good graphics properties. Um, it's important you understand this because you're going to be doing your programming assignment with respect to, to a triangulation and a refinement of those triangulations. So if we're going to program it with these, let's talk a little bit about how we represent them so we can make sure we understand what those data structures are. Um, and so best data structure, of course, depends on what we want to do, how, how do we store them, how we can assess them. Um, we might want to, to represent them in memory so that it's more efficient, for example, to pass it off to a GPU or whatever. Um, for this assignment and for the way we're going to look at them, we're going to keep a relatively simple representation. Um, we're going to have the first line of the file tell us the number of points. Then we're going to have a sequence of points. So here's all the points. Then we're going to have an uh, integer that tells us the number of triangles. And then we're going to have a list of points for those triangles. So this triangle is 1, 2, 5, which means I take 0, 0, 1, 0, 0.53, and I connect them. Okay. 1, 2, 5. 2, 3, 5 means I go from 2 to 3 to 5, and that gives us the second triangle. Third triangle is 4, 5, 1. 4, 5, 1 gives us this triangle, and so on. So given a set of points, we're going to want to, we can have a problem. What is the triangulation? Find all the, the, the pro, A proper, not D. Find A triangulation. And then we could also have another thing. Given a triangulation, can I find a better triangulation in terms of how they might be used for lighting or shading or some other criterion that we're going to want to optimize? Okay, so the criterion might have just a list of points and then create the triangles. Um, so the one thing about this, this representation is if I want to change things, if I don't change the points, I can change the triangulations by just changing this bottom set of data. Relatively straightforward. Okay, so now let's, given our triangulation, look at some applications that might be very useful. For example, given a point um, P that's inside the convex hull of the triangulation, we can ask, what triangle is this in? Now you can imagine graphics application where, for example, I want to know if I'm overlaying my mouse on this drawing and I click on it, what triangle was clicked? So I'm given a point, I want to know what triangle is it in? So I, for example, could light it up and move it around or do something else with it. Um, so there are two methods. The first method is to compute P's barycentric coordinate with respect to all the triangles and then if it's inside the triangles, it'll have all positive barycentric values. If it's outside, the triangle will have some negative. Um, an alternative is to use the sign of the barycentric coordinates to travel the triangulation. So if I start, let's say that this is the, the point I'm at. If I, if I'm sorry, I'm going to start down here. And that's the, we're, we're going to ask where we are. So I ask, is it in this triangle? And it's not. But then... 
if I do the barycentric coordinates with respect to this triangle, it'll actually be to the left of the, this line, to the right of the, to this side of that line, to that side of this line, but it's going to be on the opposite side of this line. So it'll have a negative barycentric coordinates with respect to this edge. So then we just go to this triangle and say, okay, go to the opposite side, get the coefficients. And so for this one, the, the barycentric coordinate associated with this point, with this side, would be negative, and so we can walk through this. So instead of trying to, to compute barycentric coordinates of everything, I compute it for one, and then I walk along the structure by just looking at what sides are in common and, and we're doing this. Now, here, this is almost half the triangles, maybe a third, but if I did something where I might have millions of triangles, I might only have to, to walk through half, half a dozen or so if I'm close to get the right point. point. Okay, so here's the point location algorithms are written out. Choose a random triangle. Guess somehow. Compute T's barycentric coordinates back to that triangle. If all the coordinates are positive, then output the current triangle because we found it. Determine the most negative of U, V, and W, so of the three which has the biggest negative sign. Set the current triangle to be the neighbor associated with that coordinate and go to step two. So this last, this step here of set the triangle to be the neighbor associated with this coordinate is the most tricky. Um, so let's go back for a second and briefly look at how we would do that in our representation. So let's say that I, I actually was doing this test and I started in this triangle and I found out that P2, so I'm starting in triangle one, I find out that P2 is not the, uh, is the most negative. So um, my, my points could actually be over here. I'm gonna start with trying to find this point. Um, so I go to f this edge, I wanna go across it. Well, what does it mean to go to this edge? It means to look through this list and find, uh, I, I'm looking at one, two, five, so now I want to find another triangle that's got 1 and 5 in it. So I have to search through all the triangles. I find 1, 5. Now I go, and I can do that because I can look first for the ones that have 1, and then which other ones that have a 1 have a 5 in them. So that's this one. And I get 1, 5, 4. I might test this again and figure out that 5 is the most negative coordinate. So now I need something that's got 1 and 4 in it. I go back, I look through all the ones. I find 1, 4, 3. And then I would test it and find out that my point was over here. So I was looking to be over here. I started here, walks me through these steps. So there's still a little bit of searching through the triangle space. Turns out that if you keep these bottom triangles in sorted order on each of the coordinates, so first you sort them on ones, and then you sort them on twos, and then you sort them on the, the second column, the third column, then you can actually make that search faster because you can do binary searches across them. Okay. Um, it turns out you can also improve this by not completing the division for determining the barycentric coordinates. Um, so if you remember our, our barycentric coordinates had this division. Well, you can sort of see that all three of these have the same division. So I'm just gonna try to figure out which one is the most negative. This won't matter, because it'll all be scaled by the same number. So I can sort of skip that division step and make it faster. Um, but then I have to be careful um, as I do that to make sure I don't use it someplace else. Um, if the algorithm is, is executed for more than one run, you can use the, same, the previous triangle as a guess. For example, if I'm sort of clicking around in, in a structure, I tend to click on one thing and then click on something near it. So I don't have to start all over again. Even though the last answer wasn't the right answer for this current object, I can start close to it, which is really just taking advantage of the coherence of the data set and the way people use things. Now, we described all that in 2D, but hey, we really want to work in higher dimensions, 3D. So the 3D triangulations are the same things. We describe 3D objects with them. The rules for triangulation are the same, except we add a 3D coordinate system to the point list, and we relax the concept that the points have to fill the convex hull because in 3D, the convex hull would be a 3D shape. Um, so we now just consider it to be a triangulation of all the points that define the surface, and the surface can have a whole, you know, an open area underneath it like this one does. Now, one of the reasons this is useful is that this allows us to describe 3D shapes, and in fact, one of the most common things we want to do in graphics is not just have the vertexes, and the lines, but we want to describe this as though it was a shaded object as we have down here. And to do that, we're going to recognize that if we think through how light works, the, the light is perpendicular to this, the normal that is perpendicular to the surface determines how light is used to, to illuminate the object. So, so let's explain that. We actually have two parts to our lighting model. The first of these is what we call diffuse lighting. This is sort of like what a piece of paper does. And in diffuse lighting, you can show that given the, the surface normal, the amount of light that comes off at some angle 
is just given by the cosine of the angle between the surface normal and the eye. And it doesn't really matter where the light sources are. There's light is accumulated by the surface, sort of goes inside the paper, gets integrated, and then comes back out in a sort of uniform in all directions. But we get this foreshortening because of the cosine effect. Now that turns out to be useful because it just happens to be that what do I know if I do a dot product? If I take the unit normal and the unit to where the, the light source is or the eye is, I get the dot product between the two gives me the cosine and the angle plus since these are unit normals, uh, that's all I have to do. If they were not unit, they'd be the length. So getting the shading given the surface normal is just doing a dot product. That's really easy. Now, if I want to do more sophisticated graphics where I have shiny spots, I have to worry about specularities. Turns out the normal is enough to do specularities as well. Given some incident ray at, at an angle, say, 20 degrees off the normal, the reflected ray will be 20 degrees off the normal. If the incident ray was at 60 degrees off the normal, so it's at 30 degrees total, it comes off reflected ray. So the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection with respect to the surface normal. So the normal tells us a lot, which means when we go to work at these triangles, what we really care about is being able to figure out for each of these triangles what is the surface normal. And that's relatively simple because it's a plane. I have three points. They define a plane. I can get the normal for that plane and label all of those points uh, effectively. Uh, giving, giving each point on the surface a normal. So how to shade it will be relatively simple. Okay, so that's our excursion into triangles. Uh, we talked about barycentric coordinates, the triangle inclusion test, which you should understand because you'll be programming it. Um, looked at some of the properties of triangles. Um, we didn't get into detail about Delaunay triangulation. We'll talk about that separately. Um, when you go to work on your assignment, I'll give you some reading. And then talked a little bit about 3D triangulations, normals, and lighting surfaces and such. Uh, so that's your terminology for this week. Um, make sure you understand what all the, the terms mean. There are some questions at the back of the book, and as usual, we'll have some clicker questions, so make sure you know what's coming.